Hey, this is Dominic, and this is your home for the cutting edge conversations on optimizing your personal performance, lighting up your sex life, and living a purpose driven life of your own design. These are the topics that Dominic and I have both struggled with in our own lives and still don't always get right. This is Brian. Welcome to the Great Man Podcast. Welcome back, or welcome for your first time to the Great Man Within Podcast, empowering you to live the greatest version of yourself. One of the things that we believe in on this show is that a great man creates environments where he and those he cares about can thrive. And a great man can't do that if he is unwilling to step forward to these more difficult conversations about race. So this is our second episode diving into a conversation about race. Our first one was a series of episodes that we did with Daryl Davis, the black man who has influenced over 200 KKK members to turn in their robes, hoods, and relinquish their lifestyle. If you haven't listened to those episodes yet, go back and download them and listen to them later. Daryl was actually just recently interviewed on the Joe Rogan podcast, so it felt like a badge of honor that we got to him first. Okay, so despite a potentially uncomfortable conversation about race issues, today's episode might just be the most fun that Brian and I have ever had on the show. And that's because we are joined by none other than the one and only B. Arthur. Not the Golden Girls B. Arthur, a very different B. Arthur. This B. Arthur is an accomplished entrepreneur, psychotherapist, mental health champion, and one of the funniest wittiest, and non-politically correct people you will ever meet. B guides us in a straightforward conversation about how white men can become more intelligent about race issues. And I do want to take a moment to acknowledge that many of our listeners are not white men, and much of this conversation is applicable for any person of any race, of any sexual orientation, and however you identify gender-wise. So, You'll hear about why it's so hard for white people to talk about race. You'll hear Brian and I fumble around in the conversation with B, particularly in the presence of black people like Brian and I were with B, and why it's so important to have these conversations without getting defensive. B guides us on the ways that we can approach conversations about race. She'll highlight ways in which you may be using racially coded language or outdated language. We'll touch upon white privilege. It's probably going to be a much deeper conversation at a future point. And we'll finish with some books and documentaries that you can use to educate and broaden your perspective on race. So who is B. Arthur? B. holds the honor of being the first African-American female founder in Y Combinator history. If you're not familiar with Y Combinator, it is a seed funding accelerator for startup companies. That's been used to launch companies like Airbnb, DoorDash, and Dropbox. Put it this way, based on admission rates, it's easier to get into Harvard, which is, has like a 5% admission rate, than it is to be accepted by Y Combinator, which is about a 1% to 1.5% acceptance rate. B is a Columbia University trained psychotherapist who served time as a New York City social worker. And her third company, which is called The Difference, provides on-demand access to therapy from your own home, even through your Amazon Alexa, which is Amazon's first mental health Alexa skill. You can download the app, go to thedifference.co, and you can check it out. Here is today's episode of How White Men Can Have Better Conversations About Race. Did you do it? Did you hit the button? I did. I hit it. I hit oh, the we are, we're we are so go right now. Okay. Right. <laughs> oh, B, I was just telling you that not that long ago I was meditating and I'm putting meditating in air quotes because I was doing something else, but I'm not going to talk about that on live air where this idea, I've, I've wanted you on this show for months, ever since we, I was on your podcast, Be the Change. And I was like, B is the person that you can talk to about anything. Thank you. That is the highest compliment anybody could ever give me. It is high praise because there's so few people I feel that like you can bring some of these difficult conversations to and get straight answers. Yes, absolutely. And that's like my vision for the world. That's why I'm in this planet in this time. Spread the gospel of feeling good about yourself, being honest about yourself and being honest with other people. It feels so good. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. So this big idea was, why don't we talk about all the things that most people are scared to talk about, like sex and mental wellness and race and racism. And I was like, Ooh, how about we call the episode? Can I ask you that? (laughs) With B. Arthur. Yeah. <laughs> and I went, and so oh we're my gonna, God, so, I love this so much. Ask me everything. <laughs> so we will test all the limits <laughs> in today's yeah. conversation of can we actually ask B anything? Oh my yeah. goodness. Let's find out. I'm pretty sure you can. So yeah. let's find out. A little, a little quick origin story. So you and I met probably like two years ago now at Esther Perel's yes. Paradox of Masculinity oh, Conference. So it was so good. You were outspoken there, like asking questions and providing like, ooh, this person's fun. And then I caught you yeah, at a break and mm-hmm. we started talking. And I came to learn that you are, at least at some point in your life, you've had Cindy Gallup as your mentor. Mentor and Lord and Savior. That's right. And I want to ask you about that in a second. But for our audience who may not know Cindy Gallup, I had a chance to see her like seven or eight years ago at a conference in New York City where she takes the stage. I have no idea who she is. This is a woman with like bleach blonde hair, <laughs> bowl haircut, wearing tight leather pants. All leather. All, like everything. all the time, and right? Whip, basically. Yes. She's like a human dominatrix whip. Yes. Yes. Like on stage. And I'm good at people's spirit animals. Dominant. Oh, this is good. Good coffee. news. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Brian? <laughs> oh, good question. What is Brian? I want to say like a cherished comic book. Like, <laughs> Brian, you're a comic book. A cherished comic. You remind me of kids I went to middle school with, you know, the good books. You're just clean, honest fun. But I don't know. Can I ask oh, you I anything? Like, I, have to I like out that. <laughs> you can ask Brian anything. By the end of this episode, I want to see if your spirit animal calibration Changes, is yes. Yeah. This is a good exercise. Mm. This All is a good group exercise. So Cindy Gallup takes the stage without much warning. The first words out of her mouth are, I'm in my 50s and I like to sleep with men in their 20s. <laughs> you were there for that talk? Yeah, this oh was this God. was before she she did this oh, she did this on a TED, TED stage. Yeah. yeah, this was in New York. Oh, Scott Galloway was my professor at oh. NYU around marketing. He had some event at the New York Times building. This is how she starts, and now everyone's leaning in. Yeah, right? I'm 50. I like to see men in their 20s, and she goes, and in the first 30 seconds of having sex with these 20 year old men, I find myself <laughs> bent over, choked, spanked, hair pulled, right. And I've come to learn that these men have been raised on a very different yes. level of sex education than I have. <laughs> yes. So I started this thing called, and, and these men have been raised on porn, mm-hmm. free porn, mm-hmm. right? at like, you know, in their teenage years, early years. So she started this company called Make Love Not Porn, where- right The social sex revolution. That's what's up. Yeah. I was there when Make Love Not Porn got started. cindy has been my mentor since way, way back, like before I got in any of this. I've done Cindy for- 10 years now. And that's what I was going to ask you is how does one go about attracting Cindy Gallup? That's a great way to as ask a that question because looking back at it now, it had to be Cindy Gallup to be my, you know, the one to put me on, the one me to bring me into this New York scene because she is a lightning rod. She is a dominatrix whip and she had me over her house in Chelsea. She just left advertising and I was starting my first, first business. The difference is my third company. And I was just out of grad school. I was like, ah, change the world. And she was just like looking, figuring out what she was going to do. She was like, we both lived in Chelsea. She was like, come over my place. I come over. This is when she was living in what is quote called the black apartment. Painted to look like her favorite bar in Hong Kong. All black, crazy art. She has a, a Gucci chainsaw. She has, uh, <laughs> I swear to God, covered in diamonds. She has. This is shocking, but not surprising. Exactly. She yeah. has like a Swarovski encrusted alligator on like an East Saint Laurent leash. Just like this insane kitchen, a bathtub that's like right next to just nuts. And I was like 25. <laughs> like I was in grad school, and I'm like, you are the most excellent thing. I mean, it's like looking into the future. I like came right then. And I was like, I told her my idea. She was like, I like it. And I wrote her, you know, straight out of school. Like I wrote her this thank you card. And I swear to God, a five dollar Starbucks gift card. Oh, that's so looking cute. Looking back, I was like, Jesus Christ, so I thought I was an idiot. To be like, thank you so much for your time and mean a lot to you. If I could check in from time to time. And that's how it happened. You bought her a five. Five dollar Starbucks. Gift that's card. the key to life, Dominic. The key that. to life is five dollar Starbucks cards. That's no, that's on. how you get a mentor. That's that, my calling a card. Just yeah. show people value and appreciation. Show them your either their appreciation and value all the time, and that's what I do. Like I'm like a dude. I fall in love all the time. Like whenever, and I life shows me a lot of really exciting things. I'm blessed like that. So like I'm just always like falling in love with things. Like when I met you, I was like, wow. Like the conversation we maybe had like not even fifteen minute conversation and stayed with me for a year. And then you got to come on my show. We had like a really intense conversation. I learned a lot about dudes. Like I identify as an alpha white male, even though I'm in this like banging <laughs> ass black female body, but I identify I live my life like the white man because I'm the American dream. What do you mean by that? Well, like, I mean, I'm entitled. <laughs> I'm really horny. Like I'm always accidentally offending people, you know, 
like y'all, right? <laughs> like, I'm the white man whisperer. I understand. Like I go through it, you know? So I just feel like I get to live two worlds. Seriously, like my, my family's from Ghana and West Africa. I was the first one born in this country. My grandmother couldn't read or write. And then like one generation with me, I'm a job creator. Yeah. With like a whole bunch of submissives, money, you know what I'm saying? Like, a whole bunch of submissives. Yeah, man. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I have to stay on this frequency if I want to survive in Trump's America. You know, <laughs> I got to make y'all think I'm one of y'all. <laughs> Black women are the bottom of the that is, it's so, be that's B, that's such a it's a perspective that I find funny and also jarring and yeah. heartbreaking. Yeah. Like there's yeah. things that I haven't thought about. Like, am I a Trump fan? No, not at all a Trump fan, but I've never thought, how do I survive in a Trump based world? Yeah, man. Right? Like, and to yeah. just hear the words coming from like, how do I do that? How do I like make this exist? And how do I like, keep where I've come to? in this world is like, whoa, we, we have something to talk about here because this is a perspective I haven't considered. Well, we have to keep calling it out, right? Because I hope this is one of the questions about race and white privilege, because I, I noticed that white men get really bristly around that term. That's white privilege. I can acknowledge that as a black woman, I have white privilege because I have a white voice. I have a white name because I like white things. I love bougie delights, like après ski and kill martinis, <laughs> all those bougie delights. Yeah. And I make white people comfortable. I'm attracted to, I had a nose job, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I relax my hair. Like I get to pass, you know, <laughs> socially I can pass as a white person. Right. And so I can acknowledge that I get treated differently than people who are in Shaniqua Jenkins, than people who hmm. have a black accent, than people who don't know what Barada is. You know what I'm saying? So like- I don't know what the, <laughs> Barada is. She delights. Okay. You're going, you're going whiter than me, actually. This is very, this is very white. You. I told you, I yeah. am an alpha white male, maybe an alpha white woman. <laughs> no, nah, alpha white male likes Barada, a gay one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is everything that we've wanted to talk about and more like you've jumped in so quickly. Barada? And- Barada, yeah, that was, that was way over the line. <laughs> Across yeah. the line. See myself. Yeah. I asked for foreplay in this podcast, not jumping straight into the deep end. And here we are 20 feet deep and I'm just barely swimming. <laughs> so you're awesome, B, to have these conversations with, right? And also recognizing that a lot of our listeners do want to know how to approach these conversations in other contexts where say maybe people aren't as open or our listeners don't necessarily know like how to even broach these conversations. Right. So I think Maybe one of the first things that we'd like to do, and Brian, you and I were talking about this before B showed up, was like to set a proper container for how can we enter these conversations more often? More and, honestly. And more, yes. And Brian, you had some like great thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm glad B, you opened it the way you did because what you have found, and maybe whether it was because of a want or because of a need, when you stepped into a different perspective, you found power there. You found something that was valuable to you. And then a lot of the work that Dominic and I do around women and Me Too, we've started to develop an understanding of a new perspective in women and how we can bring that to other guys. And we've seen what happens in our lives when we can understand that. The question that we ask ourselves is if we really truly understood everybody's perspective, how valuable would we be in connection and in business and everything else? And so the intention for some of this conversation is if we truly want to understand and not sure how to ask, how do we get to that place? How do we get to the place of, of getting to that new perspective? And so the intention is that, is to really truly just step in and understand, not necessarily do. If we get to a do action here, that's great. But I think just connecting with what we don't know and knowing that we don't know is a really big piece of it. So that's the intention. Also, how do we even start? Like, what are the words that we can use? Mm -hmm. For example, I was, I was having a conversation with some friends last night. We're talking about this podcast that we were having. And it's like, yeah, have you ever been to a store before and an associate was helping you and somebody at the counter says, hey, who is helping you? Like, could describe them. Aww. All of a sudden, it's like this awkward, closed off feeling of like, oh my gosh, like they're black, but I can't say black. Aww. So I described their eye color or the oh. shirt they were wearing or something like this. And it's like, even at that little micro level B, mm -hmm. we have a hard time discussing this and it's a scary place. So, so, 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so like, you're, you're somebody that has bridged this gap and I appreciate I'm you being here. To. I'm happy to. Because, you know, it's funny. I was actually having, with, you know, I have a lot of white friends, close, close, close white friends. My one girlfriend, Julie, I was over her house. Like, I know her kids. Like, I've been with her through so much. And like, I've seen them. And now the oldest one is 18. Right. And she's like, you know, I just worry for him. And he was like, come on, be, be honest. Like, there's never been a worse time in history to be a white man. <laughs> And I was like, let me sit with this because on the one hand, I love you deeply. <laughs> I won't say his name, but I love you so much, bro. On the other hand, like, okay, fine. There's also, on the flip side, never been a better time to be a black woman. But it's still, guess what? A way better time to be a white man. Mm-hmm. And so I said, I won't say it's hard. Like, maybe a worse time because y'all are being challenged on things. But the issue is more that, like, okay, fine. As a white man, yes, you'll get criticized. But as a black person, I'll get killed. Mm. Right. And even then more often, you know, so it's kind of like sometimes there's not a lot of empathy for it. But like I said, because I'm able to bridge two gaps and again, therapy is all about understanding. And I truly believe and we live on this philosophy. It's hard to hate someone when once you've heard their story. Right. I mean, yeah. I've worked with murderers. I've worked with people who have like left their kids over drugs. Like before I got into startups, I was like a for real social worker. And like when people are doing these things, nobody ever thinks they're the bad guy. Everybody has their reasons, you know, and you see that, especially in couples counseling. So for me, yeah, I'm always the person to ask, like, well, for my white friends, especially people who are sincerely want to understand. I don't waste energy on people who are like, prove me wrong. Da, 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 da. What about? No, I, like, right. you're lost. You're choosing to be that way. Like, I'm not on that. I'm evolving. But for people who truly seek to understand with honest intention, it's just like anything else. When you are new in a world, when you are a guest in someone's home, you come in humbly. <laughs> Should I take off my shoes? I brought you some wine. Come in with honest intention. Seek to understand and just lead in love. You know, I mean, I won't say do this to all black people, but like if you're asking about hair, I don't really understand hair. Can you touch my hair? I will let some of my friends touch my hair (laughs) as long as I get to touch theirs. Because again, you're treating me like an other right now. We're going to do it together. We're going to touch each other's hair. So you know what what you're making me feel like and to connect you to what the next black person who won't take the patience with you (laughs) you know, might be feeling. Okay, can I touch your hair? So we're going to do this together. Yeah, let's talk about the hair thing, let's right? Because that comes it, up a lot, which is it's so a big thing. Why do you why do you think white people are so fascinated with touching <laughs> your hair? You and tell me. I, it's actually never been you've never a had thing an instinct, right? But I hear women. I'm like, she wore a hat for a reason. <laughs> right. <Yeah. yourself. laughs> to protect myself. <laughs> I, I know who right. you are. Yeah, She's like, there's wearing... two white guys, and I I need to cover I up. I need to protect yeah. myself. My <laughs> assets. This is not just a hat, too. It's like Fort Knox, <laughs> Fort Knox the level. Hat. It's the hat, right? So there's no way of me getting this hair. hat is running for 25. <laughs> B, B came in, she goes, I don't know, is my hat too big? We get it, B. It's safety. It's self-conscious about it's safety. Yeah, you figured me out. I got my secrets. So that's the truth. Black women have secrets in their hair. It takes a lot of work. Black hair grows up, y'all's grows down. Right. So there's a whole hmm. bunch of stuff we have to do to get it to lay down. So that's the main thing. It's more disrespectful to our process to touch our hair. Okay. It took a lot of man hours to put all the moisture in there, to comb it, to slick it, edge control, all that shit. You just disrupted my whole shit. So yeah, keep your hands to yourself. Or just ask me about it. We love talking about our hair. It's like fascinating. Yeah. And what is it? Is it the entitlement that like, oh, I just get to touch your hair without considering how that may impact you or affect you that that causes the risk? You can compare it to anything. Like pregnant women don't like their bellies to be touched. Like even Mm. though the intention is good. Oh my God, a baby. People love babies. Like why would you touch somebody's tummy? In, In a regular situation, it would be weird. You know, and so like that's something that pregnant women have to do. And people are like, God, I was just being nice. Same thing. I understand they're approaching my hair with fascination or whatever. I get that. It's fascinating. But to the average person, it would be strange that you're like, oh, huh? you know, it would be a strange thing if I came up to you. It was like, whoa, why do you have hair on your face? It would just be weird, yeah. you know? So I think, again, like if it's like genuine curiosity, like it's hard to be mad at that. But when people are like, that's weird, or why do you do that? You know, and some black people, most black people were raised with some element of that. There's a wrongness in your otherness. And that Mm. is what will make people defensive about any comment on their appearance. Mm. I was in a conversation with a woman and she was describing a situation she was in in a boardroom. She was having a business meeting and it was mostly guys in the room. And she spoke up and she had an idea. And when she talked about her idea, one of the guys said, actually, that's a good idea. And she then described how demeaning that was because as a woman, actually, you came up with something good here. Oh, wow. Actually. And I reflected on my time as somebody in corporate. I'm like, did I do that? I probably definitely did that and didn't even know it. 
And when I listened to your podcast on the race card, you guys talked about something called microaggressions. And if you ask Dominic, Dominic, are you a racist guy? If you ask Brian, are you a racist guy? Like, no, like I'm not. And I'm sure there's some behaviors that cause environments that are less than conducive to connection. And so I'm curious if maybe you can describe like, those things that we m- may do yeah. that cause those environments. Yeah, this is a great question. So, so microaggressions, it actually was on the research for microaggressions at Columbia University. Shout out to Dr. Daryl Wing Su, who was also on the Clinton Race Initiative. And I was on that research team my first year of grad school. Then I quickly dropped out because I was like, this is dumb. Like, I will never make money as an academic. However, <laughs> they did great work about microaggressions. It's just in a general overview. Microaggressions come in three categories. Micro insults, micro invalidations, and just aggression, aggression. <laughs> like, <laughs> micro, no, no, by micro passive aggression. And what that means is saying something Thing. For example, your friend in the boardroom, like, wow, you speak so well, or geez, you're so pretty for a black girl. Oh, wait, and, and it's micro assumptions or something. So the assumption is the reason it's racist is because you don't expect a black person to speak well. Mm. So on a subconscious level, you are surprised. That's why so many black people bristle when someone like, says articulate, because any other white person, it's a very specific adjective that gets applied to black people who talk white because it's a surprise. We're like, oh, wow, you're so pretty for a black girl. So the assumption then is that most time black women aren't pretty, you know? And so these are micro insults that again, a lot of times they're invisible and well-intentioned. Those are the two primary features of them, different than regular racism. You're making me think of a Key and Peele skit that I saw on YouTube called The Racist Sports Commentator. <laughs> so it's Key and Peele, and then there's this white sports commentator who's talking about the Super Bowl. I think it's like the 2015 Super Bowl, and it goes, Tom Brady versus Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman is a black cornerback, I think at the time for the Seattle Seahawks. And he was like, Tom Brady, the ultimate hard worker and the tactician, <laughs> and Richard Sherman, freak of nature. <laughs> but articulate. Oh my God. Yes. And then Key and Peele are kind of like, well, huh. he also kind of went to Stanford and he's, he's, a, he's a pretty smart guy, right? And then they start to unravel his, like you know, they ask yeah. about other players. They're like, <laughs> yes. Julian Edelman, who's a white guy, industrious. Mm-hmm. You know, Vince Wolfork, freak of nature who learned magical skills from his grandma. Just like, <laughs> like over and over and over again. And he's yes. like, I can't, what, about, what do you want me to say? I call it like I seize it. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> Exactly. It's just that like, I mean, you see it like there's people who just micro invalidations is my favorite one because it's kind of like, or when people ask you to dismiss your experience. Oh, it wasn't really that. I used to date this. I mean, I've dated lots of white guys, but I used to date this older rich one who was very resistant to this, any idea of racism. Like his sister actually said nigger rigged on a conversation when I was on speakerphone. And she was like, well, I'm not racist. So she has to get over it. You know what I mean? Just straight yeah. up shit. I'm like, why the fuck? I'm too sexy. I was like 26, you're 46. Why the fuck am I dealing with this shit? And literally, even when it happened to him, we were waiting for a cab over where I used to live in like West Chelsea. And a cab pulls up, it's got the light on, they turn it off and then they lock the door. Like that happens sometimes mm-hmm. because like, I've been in cabs where people will pick me up and they go, where are you going? Brooklyn or the Bronx? Before I've said oh, a word, you yeah. pick me up in Manhattan. The assumption is that, and so that's why cabs can discriminate against black people. And literally Frank is like, well, maybe there was another reason. Why are you so resistant to the idea that it happened because we're black? Why are you dismissing my experience? Again, I'm used to it. You're not. I get that you're uncomfortable with that. And that's what we see most often what can be frustrating sometimes with talking with white people. They really are resistant to the idea because they're taking it as a personal attack. When I describe white people, I'm not describing you, Dominic. You've always been nice to me. I'm not describing you, Brian. I'm talking about that has been some black people's experience with some white people. Sure. And if you can't even acknowledge that it happens sometimes, then, I mean, come on, you know, like, yeah. like I said, I have a lot of privilege. I have had racist experience in my life, but I've had, I know other black people have had way worse ones, like life-changing things, things I would never recover from, really hurtful things. And I believe them. I'm not going to deny that that happened to them just because it's never happened to me. For some reason, men even, men are worse at this when it comes to men and women. Men really would rather believe that a woman is lying, that a guy actually was capable of raping a woman. When y'all know y'all have friends that are dogs, y'all know y'all know guys like that, just scumbag hornbags who would literally fuck an animal. You know there's guys out there like that. So why would this woman need to lie? It's so nuts. So yeah, yeah, it's just the resistance that makes it hard to have any meaningful conversation. I'd love your perspective on this, B. So one of the the most impactful books I read last year came to me from my dear friend of mine named Terry. And it's a book called White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. And it's about why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. Mm -hmm. And a big part of the premise of why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism is like we've set up this paradigm that 
racism is done by these egregiously disgusting characters who are wearing hoods and right. robes who are basically bottom 1% behavior, mm-hmm. like horrifying right. behavior. Mm-hmm. And as long as you're not that, then you can't be. But exactly. being called into any conversation around potential ignorance or maybe me having a blind spot or me being microaggressive without knowing it, if you were to call me forward on that, that would sweep me into this category of racism mm-hmm. that I've boxed into, in like, which now turns into this character assassination, which makes me mm-hmm. not able to look at that without severe that's discomfort like does that ring yeah true that's yeah. just ego that's why people resist anything i'm a therapist okay people pay me to convince them to be different <laughs> and they still don't do it you know what i'm saying <laughs> we are homeostatic creatures our body really wants to stay the same because that's how it knows how to live and so yeah i get the idea that you'll be uncomfortable if you have to face this thing like oh my god am i am i the baddie you know i had to face this recently i love being a woman it's the best i wouldn't trade it for the world and Recently, all the conversations, I got called a TERF, which is trans-exclusionary radical feminist. Trans-exclusionary radical feminist is a TERF. It's a TERF. It's a slur used by the trans community and the non-binary community against women who don't want trans issues part of the conversation around feminism or women, female identity. Women, for example, who say women, trans women shouldn't compete in women's sports. Trans women shouldn't compete in women's pageants. You know, trans women technically aren't women because they can't get pregnant. J.K. Rowling just got dragged on Twitter because she defended a woman scientist who said that there's no biological imperative for trans women. And people like canceled her. Fucking J.K. Rowling. People were like, you can dream up witches, but you can't imagine (laughs) it wants to be a woman. (laughs) And then it's kind of like, okay, I get it. But like, I realized that I was a turf, you know, because like, I feel like I'm very protective of women and women's issues. And, you know, yes, I believe that trans women are women. But as young, oh my God, I'm just going to go ahead and say this. From an adolescent development perspective, Girls, young girls are preyed on from the time forever, from society, messaging, you just, your body, it's like objectified. Whereas young trans women are treated like gay boys. They're not treated like young Mm, girls. And mm, that's a different mm, experience. mm. So it doesn't go both ways in that specifically age group. And I said it once to a non-binary friend of mine, actually somebody used to work for me. And she was like, no, that's wrong. And it's like, I had to acknowledge that I didn't understand and I couldn't understand. I have no idea what it's like to be a trans person. So maybe I shouldn't speak on it until I know what the fuck I'm talking about. And for that, I have to guess what? Listen, I don't know at all. So that's just ego. Let me put that on a side. Somebody might know some more about life than me. That's okay. Right. But in that moment where they confronted you about no, you don't have it right. You don't know what it's like. I imagine there was something I was inside bristly. of you. Hell yeah. yeah bristly. I was yeah, feeling okay. that salty. I'm like, listen, Bill, <laughs> I'm going to call you what I want to call you, okay? Your mama called you. No, I'm not going to say her name because she taught me a lot. It was crazy yeah. too. I had to write a, um, a recommendation for her on LinkedIn and or for them. And this was the first recommendation she would, they would be getting with the new pronouns. And so I was like, okay, now both of our rights are being challenged because I understand your identity, but I'm a black woman. If I write, they is nice. They is important. <laughs> you know, like, with the, I'm like, oh my God, it's grammatically incorrect. Come on, I'm articulate. <laughs> Just like Richard Sherman. Right, yes. <laughs> Just like Richard Sherman. Don't do me like that. But I had to let go. It's not about, do I give a shit about a LinkedIn fucking recommendation? No. So like, I had to put my ego aside and do what was right for them. Cool. And be in some of the in some of the early conversations, like men's men's conversations, these are exclusively men's circles, men's group, and we were talking about Me Too. There was a, a majority of people were feeling like, you know what, Brian, I'm not going to stand up and be an advocate for women, nor do I really plan on changing my behavior. But what I'm going to do is lay low. I'm just going to do nothing. I'm going to okay. I'm going to like just let this whole thing, you pass. know, called Me Too pass, and then I can just be my normal self. That's one thing. And when I hear things like in the news, Black Lives Matter, whatever it may be, like there's part of me that's like, man, like that's horrific and needs to change. And also, I don't have a clue of what to do. And then I get in my head about, well, like who am I to do something? Mm. What is it? Like, do I know? Do I actually have some sort of solution? Can I do anything? And does that do anything have to be some sort of a grand gesture? Or is it something that I can just be every single day? And so part of my question for you is, 
how is a, a white guy interpreter that doesn't speak up on some of these issues? And what is a better way forward? I'm just, I'm a bit clueless oh, here. I love this question. Yeah. See, humility, willingness, and openness to understanding. We, we don't even know what to ask. Yeah. This is like a big part of our thing sometimes. Yes. Like Brian and I were even talking about this before the other, and you could hear like he was trying to find his words there too. And I was wanting to help him, but like I didn't have words either. Yeah. And I understand the fear, right? Like nobody wants to be called a racist. Like, and I've seen it. I actually got called a rape apologist when I was talking about my own sexual assault because it triggered a woman in the audience and I was just like, Jesus. And like, guess what? I, exactly. I wanted to shut down. I was like, well, shit, I won't say anything else then if I'm right. going to get screamed at. Right. So, so I understand the fear around there, especially if you don't, like we've avoided talking about it for so long. We don't know how to talk about it now. Yeah. So I get that. And I have like all forgiveness and understanding for that. But I feel like at the same time, if you want to do the work, like there's no more room. And I feel really strongly about this for men and for white people. There's no more room to just say, I'm not racist. You have to actively be anti-racist. Yeah. How do we do that? What are ways? So are we- here's the thing. Women didn't create sexism, so we can't defeat sexism. Men have to do it. Black people didn't create racism. White people did. So y'all have to kill it. And here's the thing about racism. It's not going to die. You have to kill it. Like we see mm-hmm. what's happening with our administration. They, they're dying and they know, they know the numbers. And they, that's why they're go, not going down without a fight. They're like, let's cheat. Let's hide. Let's obscure. They don't even care. They are really trying to hold on to this power structure. That's cool, but y'all are dying. So I feel like first it comes with understanding that racism means that you think white people are better than black people. And if something you say or does alludes to that, then on some level you have subconscious racism. But let's start with different. I think it makes it easier if we start at a different level, which just accept and acknowledge that everybody has prejudice, which means based on your skin color, your gender, your sexual orientation, I'm going to assume certain things about you. I'm going to prejudge you. As a white man, I'm going to assume certain things about you, even though I don't know what your life is like. And I can say that. So there's nothing wrong with just admitting that. You can assume that a certain things about me because I'm a woman, because I talk to some. Of course you're doing that. Humans, like the way we understand things, we're categorical creatures. Can I eat it? Can I fuck it? Can I make money about it? Mm-hmm. You just make immediate judgments when you see something. Just acknowledge that. You're going to have prejudice inside you. And when they get challenged, if somebody calls you on it, ask yourself, am I prejudging this person based on this? So I think, yeah, you have to actively be like when you hear dudes talking about, yeah, I fucked this girl while she was passed out. You have to be like, yeah. dude, come on. Like, you know, you have to be your brother's keeper, you know, because yeah. when a girl says it, it didn't happen. Yeah. Yep. So same thing. If, if your friend insists on saying to Edward, all right, dude, come on. Like, you can't do anything else. Tell a better joke. Tell a different joke. You know, like. Where I think it's more insidious is what Robin D'Angelo calls in the book racial coding. Yeah. Instead of saying, like, I, I've actually never grown up in an environment of friends or kept an environment of friends that are outwardly using the N-word. Mm-hmm. But there's definitely the coding of that's a, a ghetto neighborhood. Right. Or that school system in that district is unsa- it's exactly. unsafe. And we all know what that means. Mm-hmm. And what she talks about in the book is like racism is, is less of a, an individual act and more of a systemic issue, right? And systemic, mm-hmm. when you're talking about at the top levels of all of government and business and oh, media, absolutely. it's all white, mostly white men. You're talking about like these coded languages that kind yeah. of perpetuate that. Yes. And I don't think a lot of us, myself included, for most of my life, like really recognized the divisiveness right. of that. So yes. when you say it's not going to die, it has to be killed, that really strikes a chord. Yeah, it's tough. And even with well-meaning white people, like there's a lot of Bernie supporters who have like said to me, oh, come on board because I don't fuck with Bernie Sanders at all. <laughs> <laughs> and people were like, well, Bernie really cares about a criminal justice. And I'm like, hmm, that's interesting you say that because nobody in my entire family has ever been in prison. And I'm the rowdiest mm, one of all, yeah. <laughs> including me. I got mad charges, no convictions. Well, like, yeah, you're still very young, B. There's still time. God, I've committed like, mad crimes. <laughs> and I it's still a good thing we didn't hit that record prison. button earlier, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. Shut up about it. But yeah, like, why would you assume that criminal justice would be an important issue to you? You're assuming that my family's been like in prison, you know? And like, these are well-meaning white people, but again, you're thinking that it's a black issue. So stop it. So I'd like to go just a level deeper than this. When I was listening to your podcast, I heard a statement that said it was around this idea of psychological safety and feeling and just feeling safe walking around. I'm just going to say America. Yeah. And there's a sense of like, if I'm a black woman walking around, and a white person's around, I have an immediate sense of not feeling safe and how that can really mess quite frankly with our biology. And so what I'm curious about this idea of psychological safety comes up in culture conversations around workplace. 
And I am curious, like, yes, I think in any case, Dominic and I, if somebody said the N word, we would correct and we would say, hey, look, that seems almost obvious. What I'm curious about is given that we're not changing our skin color anytime soon, how do we start to create environments? How do we make the space to help reduce that level of anxiety that comes with not feeling safe? Like, is there a proactive do? Yeah, I guess that that's my question is, is outside of some of the more obvious stuff, which I'm hopeful that anybody listening to this podcast mm-hmm. is aware enough to do. What are those things that we don't even recognize that we should be doing? It all comes down to right now we're at a place where we have to overcorrect. You know, I think that's why Hillary didn't win. People were like, I don't want to just nobody wanted to just keep kicking this can along the road. And like Trump was offering drastic change for a certain kind of person. But like the reason Dem turnout was low because people were like, oh, we're just going to keep this kicking along the road, not addressing things in a truly meaningful way that would stop some of these actions. And so overcorrecting means going out of your way. So, yeah, I get that, you know, you understand that your uncle isn't really racist. He just said something, but <laughs> you've got to be the one to be like, you can't say that anymore. You know, yeah. like let that person use their pronouns, like stop talking shit about Meghan Markle, just shit that you know is rooted in racism. You have to call it out every time because like, again, we need people to stand up for us. They don't listen when we say it. White people are just starting to realize that racism exists because of body cams and stuff. And even me, honestly, I'm a black woman. Like I said, I've had a lot of benefits in life. I was super patriotic. Like I said, I'm the American dream, immigrant parents. You know, my parents had to go through all sorts of shit and like speak different language. And I came up once Ivy League did all everything right. And when I woke up on what, December, what was the date? November 9th, 2016. I was like, oh my God, they hate me. Like they secretly hate me. Nobody really wants me here. I wasn't actually supposed to win. And that realization is real. Like your body feels it. Like you said, your biological compositions, when you realize that your environment is a threat, I feel unsafe. There are people out there that if they could kill a black person and get away with it, they would. Mm -hmm. Those people auctioned off to buy George Zimmerman's gun. Those people are always downloading to crowdfunding to save racist cops. There is a place in New Orleans to this day that you could go in if you're a cop. Oh, no, they stopped in the 80s. If you're a cop who killed a black person, killed a nigger, let's say like that was the offer, killed a nigger in the line of duty, you go in and you get a free ham. Mothers in New Orleans, call it out. Get a free ham. A free ham. That's how much they just don't want black people here, even though y'all brought us here, right? That's the realities that black people know about, that white people didn't. And whenever we'd say that, they believe you're being too sensitive, stop playing the race card. Do we die all the time? Mm-hmm. That hasn't happened to me, but it happened to people. And that practice actually stopped when a black cop killed a black person in the line of duty. Not obviously intentionally, whatever came in and asked for his free ham, and that's when they stopped it. Wow. So just acknowledging that these things exist, mourning with us, if we really are brothers, especially the religious people, if you really care about humans, like mourn with us, you know, like fight with us. We have to fight. Like we can't win. We are the minority, you know? So just overcorrecting. And honestly, just please protect women. Like, I mean, I identify the most as like what women go through. Like if you look at what black people have to go through in America, you're like, man, God must hate black people. You know, if you look at what women have had to go through through the history of time, just our erasure and history, there's so many family trees and like important families that don't even list the woman. They just say this person had a son somehow, like he had another son. Women aren't on the family trees It's through history. Only now we're getting our due. Please defend us. Damn, if we ask for just equal pay, Time for our vagina seal because we had your monkey ass children. Jeez, give us a break. Wow. There's just a resistance. Like every time you say, oh, this is hard for us, there's just like an instinct to want to tamp, tamp it down. Hmm. So you like when anybody else tries to dismiss it around you, don't let it happen. Yeah, thank you. So it's overcorrecting us being the ones who are vigilant, right? Yes. And you have to be anti racist, you have to be an active ally. Y'all have the power in the system as it stands right now. So, y'all are the ones who have the power to help change it. How else can we be active allies? So, calling out the uncle who's not racist but said that thing, right. and you know, our friends when they, when they step out of line is to like to call that out. You can't do that anymore. What are other ways, like some specific ways, do you think that we can mm-hmm. continue to become active allies? Because part of it is, is education, yes. right? And like we, the thing that I want to prevent against is, and Brian, you talked about this, I think there's like a, Something about like white saviors, yeah. you know, this oh, thing yeah. of like, oh, no, I've, I've, no I've white this, yeah, yeah. I, I've listened to this one podcast with B, and she told me to be an <laughs> activist, and I'm going to go out and tell everybody that, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like when you haven't really done the inner work, right? Yes, right. And, and, and Dami, I mean, just an example that happened just here on this podcast is a few weeks ago, I watched the 13th, right, a documentary about like Black history and incarceration yeah. and oh, everything else associated with it. And I was like, this is outrageous. I can't believe this is, a, this is how it happened. And this is crazy. And then, like, and then two things happened. One is, I don't know what to do, to which we've already talked about. 
But two is, as B, you were describing, like, don't assume that's me. Like, nobody in my family is incarcerated, and that's not an important issue to me. I'm like, oh, crap, I have it wrong. Like, actually, that's not just a black thing. And so, to your point, Dominic, of, of how do we get away from the, oh, that's yeah. the thing, or that's the thing, or that's the thing, you know, that, that we that's can, like, like, help out with or overcorrect on. Because that's the thing. It's not that's the thing. It's all of the things. Mm. Like, y'all are new to this. You are, you just have one example. There's layers. Like, I actually am super sensitive to Christmas reform, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> even though I'm not, it doesn't affect me personally. So, like, it's not just knowing about the level of volunteer. You have to identify with this you know, make black friends, make an effort to like make black friends, have platonic female friends, like, like really have to understand it, you know, and go out of your way. Like my friend, who's a a really, literally one of my favorite humans in the world, just a deeply good man, fair, smart, just, just deeply good. And, And we had a conversation, he like pulled me aside and he was just like, all right, I'm going to go on this panel. It's all white panel. Everybody's telling me I should say, don't do it unless you put a woman or a a person of color on it. And I'm like, yeah, okay. That's a really good start. And he's like, but why? Like, if this is supposed to be the best, why? I don't really understand. Like, That's a big one. That's a big resistance point I get back from like hiring managers who say, how come I'm being forced to hire the woman who's less qualified Mm -hmm. or the person of color who's not as qualified? And and that's a big one that oftentimes, that that comes up over and over and over again. So yeah. what do we say when someone brings that to us? Well, what I told him, I was like, well, finish the sentence, right? Because again, this is a prejudice. The assumption is we only want the best and the best aren't women. The best aren't black. And I know that because that's what I believe. That, again, like just keep getting at the different layers. Like I know what that sentence actually means. You know what I mean? So like, it, it's just like, and he's just like, well, I never thought about that. Like I've been in, whatever space he was in for so long, I know there aren't any. And I'm like, there are, but they're usually locked out. Mm, Find okay. them. When, when you hear a statement like that, what you're saying is poke at it, poke at it, go deeper, right. go deeper, go deeper, and find the underlying potential really prejudice that's yes, there. exactly. And when you hit that, then there may be a reaction to it. Sure. Which could be a, an awakening, like, oh my God, you're right. Or it could be a, they didn't like what they saw, and now there may be, there's it's an emotional reaction. It's always that one. Like, okay. It doesn't bother you if it's not true. Right? Like a homeless person call me a cunt and a bitch. I'd be like, okay, that's where to keep it moving or whatever. If you, I consider a friend, I'd be like, whoa, like, did I do something? You know, like, cause I trust and believe you more, you know? So it, but I know that's not true, you know? So it doesn't bother. It's like, if it hits on truth, that's where. Let's hit this point that you made about make more black friends. Have some black friends. We're so fun. Yeah. (laughs) You're fun for sure. Yeah. How would I go about doing that without looking like I'm now on some campaign Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Like there are definitely, I've seen it. Like I'll give an example. Like Lady Gaga is not a gay woman, does not identify as a gay woman, but she's done so much for gay issues, gay awareness, gay acceptivity and stuff like that. And she did something after Trump won. She posted on Twitter. She was like, black people, I'm so sorry. I'm ready to listen. How can I help? Like, and people are like, it's not our job to educate you, this, that, da, 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 da. Because people are leaving. And I'm like, but yeah, but she wasn't gay either. And she was able to help and advance and make it mainstream, get white people to think about it. So I do see both sides. There are black people who are just tired of explaining. Yeah, yeah. And just want to live. I want all of us to live, though. So I'm going to take the time to people. It's impossible for me, you to know what it's like for me, unless I tell you, you know? So like, I will say yes. Like, there are definitely places if you go to a black party or whatever, people will be like, what are you doing here? But stay there. Be brave. We have to go to all white places literally all, <laughs> all the, the time. time. I'm in one right now. B, that, yeah. that, that, kind of that, statement, <laughs> that statement just hit a hit a chord. And it's something I think I could I can absolutely do a better job in my life, but like be brave. When you're mentioning like go to a black party, like I've been to events that where I am the minority at that point in time and in that space, and I feel strange, I feel awkward, I feel like I don't fit in, I feel like I don't know what to talk about, I don't feel cool enough, generally speaking. <laughs> And I don't know how to connect. And so what do I do in general? I hit the eject button and I get out. I go back to my comfort zone, which is the opposite of being brave. And I really, really love that. It's almost like, yes, feel that. Like yeah. sit in that. And Dominic, if you think about a lot of the work that we've done in the women's space, like that's exactly what we've done. We've gone to women run events where yeah. the majority of people are women and we sat there and we shut up and we listen and wow, our perspective changed and then we can connect because we've learned. And I feel like when it comes to the race piece of this, I haven't done that work. Same. I haven't gone to these events. Yep. And that's the thing. You can't change the world if you don't know the world. Yeah. 
you don't know where it hurts. You don't know what it needs. Yeah. You can't just keep saying things, throwing band-aids on it, giving hugs, hashtagging. Like you need to know us intimately. Yeah. Even last night I was at a, it was literally called Asian women in the arts event. I was the only like black person there. No, there was a Blasian girl. She was half black, half Filipino. And I was just like, bro, I love the way Asians do seafood so much. Like <laughs> no matter what Vietnamese, Laotian, Filipino food. And we just started talking about food. Like she's like, oh yeah, it's just a lot of garlic and fish sauce. And, and that's how we got down. And, you know, she was telling me about Hong Kong and she was, and once you feel comfortable, people tell you the truth. She was like, oh yeah. I was like, oh, which, how do you make your seafood? She's like, oh, we're from Hong Kong. And I know a little bit about China. And she's like, it's always so frustrating when I meet a white person and she's got a very posh accent and they're like, why do you speak such good English? And she's like, colonialism. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? Do you not know what Hong Kong is? <laughs> you know? Yikes. Same thing. They're like, why is your name Beatrice Arthur? I'm like, colonialism. <laughs> My country was called the Gold Coast. White people came and took our gold and they gave yeah. me a British name. That's what happened. And now I have a name as a golden girl. It's a happy ending, yeah. but a whole bunch of people had to die. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making this lighthearted for <laughs> Jesus. I actually don't know if I should be crying. There, there's, there's part of me. There's part of me that's very uncomfortable, and also like that's funny and true. That's yeah, what happened. Same. And this, scary. This, this, this is a perfect illustration of what's going on. And this is the general feeling when it comes to some black people and some of women's resistance to want to do the emotional labor. I'm sorry to say this, but there's studies on this. Women have a higher pain tolerance than men. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Physically, mentally, and emotionally. Think of all the things that women get implanted in, <laughs> from the time they're born. And that's why we're more mature and developmentally and stuff like that. So we have a higher pain tolerance. Black people, because we have to go through more pain, have a higher pain tolerance than white people. Mm. And people of color in general, because there's things that we know. And so, like, that's the thing. Like, th that's why you're uncomfortable, right? I can laugh about it. Because, like, that's a reality. It's not mm. scary for me. It's not sad for me anymore. I've, I've made friends with I've made peace with the pain that is life. But I can also laugh about it because I have joy now. Yeah. Then, and that's my general, that's actually, you know, we both like work with high performance individuals. It was really interesting. And I hope it's okay to say this, but when I was in San Francisco and LA, a lot of the things that when you have rich clients, you end up seeing the same problems, right? And so like all pain is real and I'll never yep. take that away yep. from it. You're a head funder with pain and it's all relative. You know, you can experience the same amount in your body. And I was just thinking like when I'm in LA, it's crazy. This is my theory and this is a podcast, you can't see it. But the idea is that if this is your baseline, not happy, but just like, content. You have everything you need. Yep. If this is your baseline and you felt this much pain, you can also feel this much joy. Yeah. Right. That's why black people kill themselves less race than white people. But if you've only ever experienced this much pain, you can only experience this much joy. So, so just so you have a visual, it's kind of like on a football field, the 50 yard line. If you go five yards left, five yards right, that's like the, like the narrow range of your emotions. But B is pointing basically to both end zones. Like you can broaden yeah. it. So if like you can feel the, the fullest end of the pain spectrum at one end zone, you could also feel the fullest pleasure at the opposite end of the that's other That's life. Just like we have a wide range of emotion, we have a wider range of emotion. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Be uncomfortable. You will know more stuff. You will literally be more emotionally intelligent when you are uncomfortable, when you challenge yourself to no longer be a fuck boy, to no longer be racist. Like you will learn more stuff. Life will give you more stuff. I always say that. That's why I'm so blessed, man. Like I want to fuck life. Yeah. And, and so life fucks yeah. with me. They're like, let's dance, bitch. I'm going to teach you some things. But I know <laughs> a lot more things than you probably a lot of listeners about life. Yeah. And I, I know the white male experience. I know the white female experience. Like just all of it, you know, and all of it is hard. But like as much grief as you can have, you can have as much praise. So yeah, be brave. Don't be afraid of the pain or the discomfort. So be criticized. You're not going to die. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that's, that's, that's one of the things that Brian and I have learned when we've gone to the women's only events was at first, I think it was, you know, there was a business reason for it, for Brian, for his startup company. Then it became kind of like this badge of honor of like, oh, wow, Brian and I are the only guys who are going to these things. Yes. And aren't we courageous? So there was ego in that. Oh. But then there was like... I know that I had this expectation on some level that I was going to be applauded, <laughs> right? Yes. Like for being the only guy to go in there. He's what a, a what a good guy. He's so woke. Hey. Good Look at him doing that. Feminist yeah. is bae, y'all. <laughs> yeah. And then just like your example of speaking about your sexual abuse and then triggering someone in the audience who came after you. When I encountered my first examples of that, because mm -hmm. I stepped on landmines of some kind right. and I triggered, I found out very quickly that there's also a lot of pain that mm. that is stored up in people but there's also blind spots of my own that i'm causing right. through my language or my being the trigger yeah that like if i'm truly interested in going into this space then i'm gonna have to take some lumps yeah like I, I recognize that and so 
as you're talking about being brave and stepping into the space where I'm actively making a, a concerted effort to diversify my social circles and my groups of friends, that like a part of that experience is going to mean that mm -hmm. some people are going to raise an eyebrow at me, mm -hmm. question my integrity for yep. why I'm there, mm -hmm. my intention for why I'm there. And like, I have to be willing to accept yes. that if I'm really, truly interested in doing it. Committed to growth. If you're on a growth path, it's not your fault that you don't know. You know, and some of the lessons are going to be hard and painful for you, and they are especially going to be painful for the ego. If you want to take that risk, that's the only way you evolve. You have to beat this to get to the next level. It's just Mario Brothers. I, I love this because it, it feels so tangible. The idea of doing some sort of grand gesture and going get my PhD in African American studies or something like this, like, is just right. It's just not realistic. And I like this as a be curious. Like go and listen be genuine. and, and then be develop humble. a new level of awareness. Mm -hmm. That all sounds super doable and actually sounds kind of fun. See, it's when you scary, it, but it sounds kind of fun. You yeah. You have to do it. You get to do it. Yeah. You be so lit on the other side of this man for real. You get to be comfortable wherever you go. Yeah. Right. Can we hit a few tactical things? I think that could be really useful. Yeah. So is there certain language that now needs to be sunset? So for example, like minorities. Oh yeah, I hate that term. I get that it describes the number, but like I hate, cause we major, you know, like we're 15% of the American population and like 80% of the culture. Yep. So just say people of color. Right. Oh, and I also, this is a secret for y'all. People who say African-American don't have black friends. <laughs> oh, <hit me. laughs> That's a secret for y'all. Wow. It's a tell for sure. Oh, it's a tell? Oh, for sure. That is so okay, so B, for, oh, for people, maybe Dominic and Brian, maybe not Dominic and Brian, like, what do we say? Black. What's wrong with being black? So I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not. That's the thing. The implication okay. is that, like, black is bad, right? Like, if you go, like, this is what you say, black. Like, I've had friends be like, well, you know, she's Jewish. <laughs> And I'm like, why are you whispering Jewish? She actually is Jewish because you think that yeah. Jewish is a slur. And that's yeah. a lot about you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah. a tell. That's a tell. You know what that's I'm saying? That's a tell. Saying? <laughs> I was at lunch. Okay, Brian, you'll know this. You'll know this. So with two of our friends, Ken and Linda, they're both black. Linda's from England and Ken is from the United States. And Ken was kept referring to Linda as African American, African American, yeah, African American, and she was like, "I'm not African American." He's like, "What are you talking about?" And she's like, "I'm from England." <laughs> <laughs> and it was amazing for me to witness. Yes, amazing. Exactly. People are Caribbean and St. Lucian. There's right. like they're just black. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with people. They're just black. Great. This is what this is good. <laughs> yeah. What else? What else do we need to be brought up to? 2020. Let me think. Yeah. So like, I mean, some people, African-American is a disclaimer, but it's a tell um, to me. <laughs> there's like a certain level of distance, discomfort, you know what I mean? That it, like, well, be careful because you're sitting next to an Italian-American right there. Yeah. So thank you. I prefer to be re referred to as, as such. such. Okay. So yeah. can I call you Guido? You actually can. Oh, I can? Yeah. Oh, y'all reclaimed it, I have, right? I have no Guido. I, there's no Guido in me. See, there it is, right? Like, I, that's why people saying the N-word doesn't bother you. It, it says a lot more about you. Like, ain't, ain't no nigga over here. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, look at your monkey-ass president, right? He's mm -hmm. niggerish. <laughs> I mean, baby mamas, all his friends are in jail, doesn't pay his bills, loud, long, rude. That is how you describe, like, a quote-unquote nigger, right? But look at my president. Mm -hmm. One wife went to, you know, like Ivy League, got money, good for the world. Like one of those people is a nigger and it's not Barack Obama. Yeah. I would say Barack's our president. I mean, that's mine. <laughs> so, so forever. Any other language that we should sunset that would be. Thing. What's, I mean, I don't know. So many things are problematic that I'm an old millennial though. So like there, I do see some things on Twitter. I'm like, damn, you want to wake up being mad. Like, geez, why are you so <laughs> mad? So like, there's a lot that I let's, I'm different. Like, I don't care if people sing it in songs. Like, so, okay. So that's on race. When it comes to women though, what is something that men do that I don't like? When you say sing it in songs like that, there was an episode of Dear White People, which oh. is a show on Netflix. Yes. And it deals with race issues at a uh, prestigious university mm -hmm. of higher education. Mm -hmm. There was a scene where there was like, you know, a party rap song was going on and a bunch of white guys were dancing with a bunch of black guys. And the part of the song comes mm -hmm. on with the N word and the white guy sings it. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the black guys are like, you're supposed to skip that. Yeah. What's your take on it? And it turns into a thing. It's that part always bothers me because like, are you really mad about it? Like, that's the song, you know, like my sister doesn't say the word at all. 
She doesn't say it at all because she just thinks it's an ugly word in the reference and the way it's, she just doesn't say it at all. But I just feel like sometimes, like in that Cardi B scene where she's like, I don't want to let all you hoes know that none of you niggas is safe. What if she was like, one, we'll let all you hoes know that none of your boyfriends are safe. It just doesn't have the same power Pop. with it. You know, so I get mm. it. And I remember one time somebody was like, Tori's Secret Models were singing that song, Song of the Summer. And everyone was like, they should all be fired. I'm like, bro, there are literally people getting lynched right now. Are you really mad about a song? Mm -hmm. Stop it. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not my fight. That's never going to be my fight. So I don't care. I know some people do care. I don't care. Like my, my sister doesn't say it at all. And she's super black. So, it, you know, just and she's super do, black. Like, super Is that what you black. We all yeah. super black. Okay. Yeah. African. Oh my God. She's natural. Oh, she's just a queen. Oh, so black. Like, bottom to black. I was just with this guy, mostly date white guys, but I started dating black guys because I went to Ghana this summer. <laughs> And when you stand in the slave castles and they tell you all the things that white people did, you're like, oh, my God, I'm, I can't ever fuck another white guy. So I've got no shot anymore? And well, I broke it. I did fuck a white guy. <laughs> I already broke it. This, I have like, uh, back, back on track. Yeah. But they're subs. They're subs. So I, so I have a sub and then I just got another one. And you mean me, subs? So I'm a very dominant woman. So like I have like white male slaves. <laughs> we call it sexual reparations. Holy shit, we got to get you back on this <laughs> podcast. And That's we, have, we have other thing. topics to discuss. That's what this I'm saying. Is this Cindy Gallup's influence? Were you, a, were you a dom before she entered your life? I was a dom in the last life. Like, I was like, you know, it's divine feminine energy. You know, I feel like, again, we talked about overcorrecting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have to yeah. dominate white men. Yeah, her, you did. He's wrong. You, did. you see what I'm saying? <laughs> okay, going to tactical. I'm jumping over this topic because I think that is another <laughs> that is another podcast. I'm not sure where we're at on time, but I want to dedicate some time to that. Tactically speaking, this word appropriation. Oh, yes. Yeah, see, I'm also maybe the wrong black person to ask. There's appropriation and there's appreciation. I love mm. when people wear black clothes and like acknowledge it, right? Like then there's like the Kardashians way of doing it, which is super offensive. Like whenever I see them all with their mixed kids, it's, it makes me uncomfortable. Like it's weird. Like you literally got hips, ass, lips, tans, and now you have black kids. It's weird. Like especially that all of them do it. It's a little This is strange. just their physical features, right? They can't really control that. But but they actively went after black men uh -huh. to have black kids and, and do black hairstyle. It's, it's a little weird. Like I'm never going to hate on a bitch getting money. Like I said, I'm a feminist first, like do what you will. But looking at it, it's just strange. But when people go to Ghana where I'm from and they wear kente, I like that. I like mm. when people like our dances and stuff. It's just like when, when they get credit for it first, it's kind of like, uh, like when people are like, Oh my God, Miley created twerking. No, you did it. That's Columbusing. <laughs> America existed. Columbus just put it on for white people. Twerking existed. Miley just put it on for white people. Like so, that's the thing where you're like, really, bro? Like Columbusing. Columbusing. Awesome. Yeah. I have not heard so that I term. like reverse Columbusing. So now we're coming for brunch, for ski, like little Nazing. You know what? He made country for black people. Now. Little Nazing. So Overcorrecting. Uh. <laughs> you see him wearing a pink country, a hat to cut CMAs. Oh, hell yeah. He's swinging that dick around. <laughs> Shout out to Lil Nas. <laughs> dick slapping these hoes all 2019. Oh, my God. Dick slapping rednecks all 2019. <laughs> and you know what's on because tall, skinny boys are always got... Oh, I'm so sorry. I just... Like, this is amazing. This is the end of the month. Just, dude, you're on it. Keep going. Don't. Don't. Yeah. Dude, don't dude, let, dude, you have yeah. more? Yeah, let it. Like, oh, I love but, talking about dicks, but I don't think that's what this show is about. <laughs> you'd be surprised. <laughs> is it? Yeah, I, I mean, we we do have a lot of them called the discerning dick, but again, yeah, it's not <gasps> oh wasn't the intention God. that we I set today. To that, I think I still have, I don't know it all. I still have a lot to learn. I'll be humble. Yeah, as yeah. much as I can. I mean, maybe I'll be versed, not a total power bottom. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> you are an infinite source of interesting. We'll have to bring you back on this <laughs> again for more. Can I ask you that with the Arthur? Let's, <laughs> let's 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 maybe wrap this with any. So I'm going to share a couple of the resources that I found to be really valuable. And then if you have anything to add to this list, B, Brian, this would be helpful too. That book, White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism by Robin D'Angelo is like a must read. I'm still making my way through The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, uh -huh. which is fantastic, which talks about basically mass incarceration as a tool for uh -huh. controlling uh, people of color, primarily black people. And the documentaries on Netflix that I found to be useful were the 13th, Brian? The 13th, yeah. Which is about the 13th Amendment. And then I know you had a chance to meet Corey Wise from the Central Park yes. Five. Yes, oh my God. Or amazing. the Exonerated mm. Five. Yes, well. that was magical. And that's Ava DuVernay. Did she win an Emmy? Yes, for that? she did. Yes, she did. So, like, I grew up when the Central Park jogger rape case happened. And I remember it five black boys were swept up very quickly and charged and were imprisoned. And spent over a decade in some cases, and Corey Wise specifically, whose, whose life was destroyed, 
you see this in the documentary or in the, in the movie were recently exonerated based on like new evidence. Mm -hmm. So like just to kind of start to step towards some of this stuff that like, for the most part, I don't know a lot of my, my counterparts who are watching or reading or educating on this. And then Brian, I think your point was really well intentioned about like, okay, now that I've read and seen all this stuff, what do I do? Like, what do I do now? Do I just, you know, have this information? I I think it revisits some of the earlier conversations we had about being brave. I have a lot of suggestions for y'all. So first, so you want to talk about race. I know her first name is Ijoma, which is an Niger Oluo. So you want to talk about race is the name of the book. And we're going to link Ijoma Alu. Oluo. Oluo. And there's another one called Thick. This is a really good one if you want to know about Black women. And her full name is by Tressie McMillan Cotton. And it's called Thick and Other Essays. And it's all about like our bodies, like black women's bodies have been identified, you know, our children. Like there's just a a lot of history with black women's history in this country. Um, I would definitely also say anything you could do for like whatever reparations this government is going to give it to us. But whatever reparations, only support if you smoke weed. I smoke a lot of weed. If you smoke weed, insist that these new boutique companies hire black people at management because like literally they're like dope boys who are selling cornerbacks who were in prison for 30 years. And now they're suburban moms making millions off of it. Those same moms that would have called the cops on my, you know, on yeah. my little cousin yeah. making millions. So insist on like and they can participate. We were the best at selling weed. You locked us all up. <laughs> and now that we got priors, we can't even participate. Yes. That's that's mm-hmm. a systemic funny, choice. Yeah. They want to keep us down. So insist, mm-hmm. if your state is makes weed legal, make sure that they also, like Illinois is doing a really good job. Anybody who's in jail off weed charges needs to be released immediately and should be able to sell and participate. <laughs> Wow. Um, same thing with women. Anytime there's a woman, like, just like, please, you guys are dogs. I get it. We're all horny. Like, I get that our dicks aren't rubbing around in our pants. Women are just as horny, but I get that it's distracting for y'all. Stop raping us, man. Like, just like get consent and learn your strokes. So many of y'all want to be doms. Learn your strokes. A woman will fuck you if she likes you. Be charming. What's learn your strokes mean? Listen, let women be great. Everybody wanted women to be sluts. No, we are just sexually well-adjusted women. Let women be on top, like, and if learn how to please a woman, you know, a lot of guys are just like, oh, I'm dumb. No, you're not. I've been with real dumb. They have strokes. Some guys can't fuck, you know, like just stop being gross. Let women participate more. Learn, like really make pleasing a woman a priority. You will enjoy sex more. The world will be better with more sexually satisfied women. You oh, know, yeah. like everybody will be a lot more chill. Prioritize being a better lover. A lot of y'all just like think of woman as a whole. The whole woman, there's so much stuff. Hell yeah. When I started my sexual health company, I had a friend of mine who was gay invite me to an event or a group called Out in Tech. And it was LGBTQ focused tech event. It was my first time going to an event like that. And I learned a ton. <laughs> and it was not altruistic. A lot of my customers were, were part of that that true and and understanding their perspective helped me be better in business. Right. right? And so I I kept going back to that source to learn more, to learn more, to learn more. And it really opened my eyes. And I'm curious, I am, I plan on doing my homework on how I can do this uh, in the black community, but are there any groups or events or things that you would recommend, especially since Dominic and I are both in New York that we could go to, to start to experience that, Yeah, I think diversity goes both ways. I would love to see more white people at diversity events. Like there's a lot, I mean, all the black people in tech know each other, all the black people in media know each other, you know, like there's events, show up, like really get in the mix. Um, So yeah, I can send, definitely send you some links. There's so many and yeah, just like, you know, be the white boy, you know, so it'll be fun. I'm telling you, it's really not that bad. I don't know why. And if we, and if we just showed up and we're like, Hey, we're just, we're here to learn and listen. Please. That's, that's, that's exactly a place to start. Yourself. My name is Brian. I'm here to learn and listen. I think your hair looks nice. I will not touch it. <laughs> I promise to not touch your hair. Got it. Perfect. They're like, come on, Izzy. <laughs> Get a plate. We call that the cookout. A, a lot of people say, oh, he's invited to the cookout. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Oh, he's about to the barbershop. Yeah, beautiful white guy. Man, it'll get you so much. Because black guys be acting up too. If you can make a white, a black girl happy, oh my God, you'll get it on. I don't even say all the stuff you get. You get a lot. <laughs> you get a lot. I love the mystery that that's wrapped in right there. <laughs> that, is a, that is a beautiful mystery to I just... describe it, but your ears aren't ready. Oh my God. Like when you tap... Yeah, give us some time. Let us warm up. We yeah, talked about foreplay early on. Ready. Just give us a little... This is a taste. This is nice. Yeah, yeah we'll be ready for you next time. Yeah, Dominic, right. Dominic and I are going to have to debrief for three episodes right. on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God. Oh, 
Awesome. Is there anything that we we want to talk about with like like? Oh yeah, I, I would love it. We are going live May is Mental Health Awareness Month. My company, The Difference, is a mass market mental health service. We connect you with a live licensed therapist within 30 minutes or less by phone or Amazon Alexa because the right talk at the right time can make all the, the difference. difference. The difference. Brian, Jesus Christ. <laughs> did you not, did it not come through? Was I on mute? It was you're, a delay. I hear you're slower. <laughs> I'm delayed. Oh. You're not delayed. You just missed the beat, white boy. Damn. <laughs> this is something I'm working on this year. My theme strokes. is movement. I'm trying to learn how to dance. And I clearly, the beat is oh, part of the strokes. issue with the dance. Yeah, man. Yes. Watch the YouTube so. videos. All right. So if someone wants to be the difference, they go on App Store, download the difference app. The di- you go to the difference.co or a native app or just really low friction. You can just text in how long is the wait and we'll get back to you. You can listen to music or meditation while you wait. And you can activate it on your Amazon Alexa or Echo. Mm-hmm. Shout yeah. out to Alexa. I know people are wary. People are like, bitch, can't keep a secret. Alexa is just our receptionist. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we'll be going live for sure. Like we've been in stealth mode only doing enterprise night. But I'm really excited. I'm giving birth to her this year. The difference officially. It'll be live for anybody to get in May. So. Hell yeah. <gasps> I know. I'm really excited. Congratulations. That's super, Thank super you. exciting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I am excited. I was scared, but now I'm excited. Hey, if you're hungry for more conversation about race, then go back to the episodes that we recorded with Daryl Davis called The Black Man Who Attends KKK Rallies featuring Daryl Davis. And the first episode was launched on April 22nd of 2019. So you can search by date. Again, it's called The Black Man Who Attends KKK Rallies featuring Daryl Davis. And he's the man who's gotten over 200 KKK members to give up their robes and hoods. Hey, Brian and I wanted to thank you for the ratings and reviews that you leave us. We read every single one of them, and they're so helpful in helping us to understand what resonates with you and helps us determine which topics that we use in the future. So if you found this episode to be of particular value to you, will you please leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts so that we know that this is the kind of topic you want to hear more about? And it also helps other prospective listeners to figure out where they can dive in first. Thank you. Thank you.